many people, demons are the epitome of evil, the devil's disciples. But in the Celtic world, nothing is so clear-cut. Some Celtic demons were gods to begin with. And as the Celts became Christians, the early saints couldn't ignore the pagan hold on their imagination. And so the gods and the goddesses, whether malignant or benign, were all demonized and became in Christian tradition the very opposite of all things good. Crom Du was a pre-Christian god worshipped by various tribes all over Ireland. He was overthrown in the end by St. Patrick. It's said that the battle took place on the top of Croch Patrick, the holiest mountain in Ireland. St. Patrick was fasting on top of the mountain when Crum Du sent a horde of demons in the guise of black crows to attack the saint and thwart his sacred purpose to save Ireland. The demonic birds lit upon the land, tearing up planted seeds, tearing rushes from roofs, and even attacking babies and animals. St. Patrick seemed powerless to stop them. When he struck them with his crozier, they simply turned to smoke and reappeared. Patrick threw holy water at them, but it had no impact. Only when he sang maledictive psalms did they retreat to the coastline, attacking fishermen as they went. But it was not long before they returned. The sacred bell was Patrick's final hope. And to Patrick's relief, the demon birds began to falter. The holy bell was too powerful for them. The demon birds disappeared to be replaced by angelic birds who sang melodiously for the tired saint. Saint Patrick had finally defeated Crum Du, and it was said that no demon came to Ireland for seven years, seven months, seven days and seven nights after Crum Dove's demise. Today, many thousands of pilgrims still come to Crowpatrick on Crum Dove Sunday, the Celtic harvest feast of August 1st, and climb the steep slopes barefoot as they pay homage to the work done by St. Patrick. There are many tales in Welsh about the devil, but what exactly is meant by devil in these stories? Is he the evil one of Christian teaching, or is he just a demon? He's big in the Welsh imagination. The place most associated with him, maybe, is Devil's Bridge in Ceredigion. Here, not one, but three bridges, one on top of the other, cross over the deep gorge of Avon Mynach. But it's the miraculous way that the first bridge came about that has given the place its name. Many years ago, an old woman that lived in Llandinach North Ceredigion had lost her only cow. Her name was Megan. And she was so poor that she would surely starve without her cow. So she searched desperately for it, high and low, accompanied by her aging coggy. At long last, Megan found her cow, but somehow the creature had crossed over to the other side of the river Manach. 
A deep god separated Megan from her cow, and there was no way that it could be crossed. A stranger suddenly appeared at her side. He offered to build her a bridge across the gorge, but only on one condition, that he should have the first living thing that crossed over. She immediately agreed. And it was only when the gentleman disappeared before her very eyes that Megan realized she had made a pact with the devil. The bridge was built overnight. And next morning, Megan stood on one side of the bridge with the devil facing her on the other side so that he could claim her soul as his payment. Well, is this not an excellent bridge? said the devil. Yes, said Megan. But I wonder is it strong enough to bear the weight of this crust of bread? Megan threw the crust across the bridge and before it could land, her starving coggy had raced over to catch the bread. It's an excellent bridge, all right, said Megan. And you can take my dog as payment for it. The devil had been outwitted. And he was furious. And he vanished in a wheel of fire. The devil was duped by the old woman, but she was one of the lucky ones. In many stories, the devil doesn't go home empty-handed, as in this next one from Ben Bekula in Scotland. When Clan Ranald was in Ballin and Gallioch on the island of Ben Bekula, he had a farmhand called Alastair Moore, big strapping lad, Alastair Moore Machen Large, and he was a keen fisherman, this fellow. He would go to the loch and he would go down to the rocks. And this night, Alastair Moore set off fishing to a river called Awin Mullen and Dui, a river that normally had plenty of fish, but this night, it was very, very mean with them. When a man appeared, a handsome man in an immaculate black suit, Alistair didn't recognise him. He'd never seen him in his life before. Could you do with a hand? He asks. Ah, maybe I could, said Alistair. And the two of them began. Oh, the fish began to come fast and furious. And Alistair would just be emptying them into a cleft on the river bank. Oh, plenty, plenty fish. And every now and again, the stranger would say, Smeeg ruin, Alistair. Time to divide the catch. No, no, Alistair would say, plenty more fish in this river. And then we would continue to fish, Alistair emptying them in the cleft on the river bank. Smeeg ruin, Alistair. The fellow would say, time to divide the catch. No, 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 says Alistair, plenty of fish in the river. Smeeg round, he would say from time to time. And one of the times, Alistair looked down towards his feet. And the fellow wasn't wearing shoes. In fact, he didn't have normal, natural human feet. He had cloven hooves, like a goat's. Clearly, a distance away. The cock has crowed, said Alistair. You can leave me now. A cockerel, said the stranger. That's just a wee autumn cackler. cock a doodle do was heard again clearly. I'm sorry, says Alistair. That is the crowing of the black March cockerel. And the fellow disappeared immediately through the roof of the sky. And Alistair turned round to view his catch. 
on all that was there on the river bank was a sad little lump of cow dung. Before he reached home that night, he heard a voice in his head. The stranger's voice. And it said, This curse will be visited on the son, or on the daughter, or on the grandchild, or on the great-grandchild. Now the following autumn, after the harvest, all of Alistair Moore's family were home together and his daughter was making potatoes, a big pot of potatoes for everyone. And she went out after sunset to drain the water off the potatoes. And she was never coming in and never coming in. And eventually the people of the house went out to look for her. And there was no sign of her. They saw the pot. It was smashed in front of the house. And the potatoes strewn along the path. And they searched for her high and low throughout the island of Benbecula and the neighbouring island of South Uist all that night. Until eventually they found her body lying dead and every bone broken in it beside these two rocks called Clachan and Moloch, the rocks of the curse. Two large grey rocks, but their faces reddened, the colour of blood, to mark the spot where the daughter of Alistair the Moor Machian Lajith was killed. Not all demons are out to steal souls. The puka is a demon that latches onto you without being asked and then helps around the house or on the farm. But if you mistreat the puka in any way, you'll be sorry. Like Job John Harry from Truin Farm in Gwent. Now Troin was a farmhouse high above the Gwydon Valley and the Pukka made his presence felt there first when the place was farmed by a man named Job John Harry who found out to his cost how troublesome a Pukka could be. At first the Pukka was a good friend to Job would do work around the farm mending hedges, cutting firewood, milking the cows, washing, spinning but everything was done at night, and nobody ever saw him. Sometimes he would talk to the family in a rich Welsh, and his voice seemed to come from the oven by the fire. When asked where he came from, he replied, from Pwllagaseg, a lake on the mountain nearby. And I knew you all before I ever came here. To repay his kindness, the maid would leave bread and buttermilk for the pukka in the same place each evening. By morning, the bowl would be emptied and the work done. But one day, the maid was foolish enough to drink the buttermilk and eat the bread and leave nothing but crusts and water for the pukka. The following day, the crusts and the water were still there, and no work had been done. Later that morning, when the maid was milking the cattle, she felt invisible hands gripping her fast. And before she knew it, she was given a thrashing that she would never forget. The next day when she awoke, she wasn't in her bed. 
She was balanced precariously on a narrow plank across the mouth of the well. She managed to get herself off, but when she did, she fled for her life. The pucker grew bolder after that. If a ditch had been dug, he filled it in. If Job built a wall, the pucker knocked it down. Every day brought new problems for Job. The dishes in the kitchen would be smashed. The milk would be made sour and the cheese mouldy. And worst of all, many of Job's sheep would die unexpectedly. Job was at his wit's end and staring ruin in the face. But one night, as he went to bed, he felt an invisible hand grasping his foot. He asked the pucker why he was holding his foot. And the pucker replied, I can grab you as I please. But I have to tell you that I'm leaving this farm. Where will you go? said Job. Wherever God wills it, said the pucker. And I will return to the Troin in nine generations time. He hasn't come back yet. But that doesn't mean to say that he won't. There are 17 principal demons in Ireland, all with different names, all causing chaos, and all trying to steal souls in their own way. The Drimnach is the cause of the big rows that can't be sorted out. The Diaw Jarag hurts and scares children. And the Diaw Orlin leads married women astray. But the worst of them all is the Kiranach. She is the only female demon, and she seeks out priests to tempt them away from Christ. There was a young man from a poor family in Lewisburg, County Mayo, who trained to be a priest. After seven years' study, he set off for home, excited at the prospect of having his parents hear his first Mass, knowing how proud they would be. The journey passed swiftly, and he soon found himself with only the Sheafry Hills to cross, and then he would be home. It was a lonely walk, and as daylight was fading, he heard the most beautiful singing nearby. He stopped his walking, listened, and then spotted the most beautiful woman sitting on the side of the hill. She smiled at him, and as he looked into her eyes, he forgot all else. Would he give himself to her? She asked. I would, he replied. Would he give her his soul? She asked. Anything, he said. She took out a quill and a piece of paper and offered it to him. He signed his name, and then he kissed her. But as soon as he did, she assumed her real form. The demon Quernach. She mocked him. He would never be a priest now. And then she disappeared. The young priest was devastated and went home to his parents and locked himself away in his room. His worried parents contacted his best friend from Manute, who hurried to Mayo as quickly as possible to see what he could do. His ailing friend confessed what had happened, but believing there was still a chance to save him, the priest from Manute arranged to say mass as soon as possible. During the service, he summoned the Quernach. He took the contract from the demon and placed it in the chalice, which turned black. The demon laughed. But then the priest related a story about how a man had sold a cow four times. And each time he had sold it, the cow had returned home. But the new owner had not turned up to claim it. Eventually, all four owners turned up together. The priest asked the demon, which of the four was the rightful owner? 
The first one, said the Quirinal. That's right, said the priest. And so it is with my friend. You might have lured him to sign his name and soul away, but you're too late. For he already gave his soul when he took his vows as a priest. With that, the chalice turned from black back to silver, and the priest handed the contract back to the demon. It was blank. The Quirinal cried out as the paper turned to flame. The priest recovered and lived a good and a long life. And as for the Quirinach, they say she still awaits the unwary on the lonely Shifri Hills. For a millennium and a half, the threats of demons like the Quirinach kept the Christian Celts on the straight and narrow path but demons change with the times. In our secular world, it's people that are demonized for their opinions and their beliefs. The gods are dead and gone, but we still have our demons. Mm.